deep down in your soul. Welcome to Wednesday night, everybody. Let's pray together, and we're going to continue to worship. Our Heavenly Father, thank you that we're together no matter where we are, because where the Spirit of the Lord is, there really is peace and joy. And so, Father, work within every song that we sing to draw us close to you, and may you be glorified tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. This is my 
of Sheer Love International and So Free out here in Thailand. When you give financially to the church, you support our ministries here in Thailand and you change people's lives for the better. I started this ministry back in 2015. I was a hairstylist when I started all of this, but God has given me a vision to use my skill to change the world. Our mission is to help men and women exit sexual exploitation safely, teach them the trade of hairdressing, barbering, or sewing, restore their mental and emotional health, and introduce them to the love and grace of Jesus. We have a team that goes into the red light district here in Pattaya, which is known as the sex tourism capital of the world. Our team meets with these people who are still being exploited, and we invite them to be a part of our program. We are so excited each and every time someone chooses to join us. When they come to our program, we start by establishing a relationship with them so we know how to best support them. Then we begin sharing the gospel with them right away so they know they have a heavenly father who loves them. We then establish a daily routine, which includes Bible study, weekly counseling, personal development, and vocational training. Our students have truly become a family and they go through the healing process together. It's amazing to see them come to life. They begin to discover their self-worth 
gain confidence, learn to overcome their shame, and find new life in Jesus. Our students who have graduated now work in salons all over Thailand, and some have even opened their own salons and barbershops. We have seen more than 1,000 students graduate from our partner beauty schools throughout Asia, Africa, and Latin America. Not only have they all found dignified careers through their training, but they also now see themselves through God's eyes and have a renewed hope. Although this work comes with a lot of heartache, I am so grateful that God allows me and my team to minister to His children in this unique way. So I just want to thank you for being a church that cares so much about people and wants to change the world and for supporting us so much here at Sheer Love and So Free. Kapun ka, puak rau rakun mak mak, ka. Oh, I'm so proud to know Diana Bautista and know that she's a part of this family, the Crossroads family. And you know what? Uh, giving unto the Lord uh, and the ministry here at Crossroads is something I'm proud to do because things like that happen around the world. In a moment, we're going to pray and dedicate our tithes and our offerings together. But if you want to give, maybe you've never given before, but you're inspired because of what you saw with Diana and the team in uh, Thailand and Cambodia. What you can do is actually get out your cell phone right now and text the word give. You're going to text it to 7 Seven seven twenty four seven. It's a cute little uh, number, isn't it? Seven representing God. So it's like God, God all the time. Seven seven twenty four seven. Uh, I made that up myself. My wife confirmed it. Uh, and so would you do that? And as uh, you're ready to, let's dedicate our tithes and offerings tonight to the Lord. God, we uh, are privileged to give unto you and the work and the ministry that's happening uh, through Crossroads Christian Church. God, would you amplify what we do and what we give so that eternal purposes might be accomplished. We praise you for Diana and the ministry. Keep them protected and effective in Jesus name. All who agreed said amen. Amen and amen. Hey, I'm Doug Hughes and one of the pastors here. What a privilege uh, to share with you tonight on behalf of Pastor Chuck. If you've been with us, what we've been doing is looking at the top 10 questions that people ask on Google about the Bible. Uh, some of the questions are really neat. Uh, does the Old Testament still apply today or has the New Testament canceled it out? Will you learn from Pastor Chuck? They both apply to us today. Uh, some of the other questions are amazing. Some of you asked, what is the best translation of the Bible? And you know Pastor Chuck. He's a big New American Standard Bible guy. But lately, he's been leaning in on the New Living Translation. Go back and listen to that message. It's fantastic. Uh, you might wonder this. People Google this all the time. What Bible prophecies have already been fulfilled mm -hmm. and which are still to come. And so I want to encourage you, go back and listen to all of those if you've missed any of those. But today I want to discuss a different question. Uh, and it's one that people Google all the time. Does the Bible teach about creation or evolution? Stated another way, uh, can a Christian believe in evolution? It's a profound question, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And so we're going to tackle that, I think, in a pretty uh, thorough way, but also uh, a pretty fun way. Some people think that the Bible and science are completely incompatible. They really have nothing to do with each other. And then there's others that want to harmonize everything in the Bible through science or everything in science back to the Bible. You might be in one of those camps. Um, my purpose really is to address the rest of the Christians, those that fear talking to anyone from a scientific background. Somehow deep down inside Christians, they feel like if I talk to someone uh, about science, they're going to know something that will ruin my faith. Mm. They don't know anything that's going to ruin your faith. I hope at the end of this message, your faith and confidence is soaring. Uh, to begin with, I want to clarify what questions com uh, um, science is comfortable in answering and which they're not. Uh, science operates in the questions of what and how. Uh, take a look at this graphic as I describe this. And yet the Bible operates on the questions of um, who and why. And I want to just tell you that science is woefully inadequate to answer those questions because those are questions of morality and science doesn't participate where, well there. The Bible will dive into even how and what, but is the strongest to provide you on the answers of who and why. That's right. I didn't have the advantage of growing up in church, and I still can remember uh, the first time I saw uh, um, the graphic you're about to see. I was in seventh grade, and they put up the graphic that all of us have seen. It's the evolution of man. Uh, if, if you're sitting at home right now or somewhere, uh, uh, think about the first time you saw this picture. Uh, it, it, it struck me when I saw it, a seventh grade boy without the advantage of growing up in church, and I'm thinking, well, that's 
That's all there is. I guess that's what I am. I'm the product of, uh, of millions of random mutations over time. Uh, I'm the uh, now uh, person that once was an ape. Uh, and I, I remember my emotional reaction uh, when I first saw that. Partly, I was scared. Uh, I was like, is that it? That's what life is about. And second, I was sad. I was sad. I don't know when you see that, uh, your emotional reaction. Um, uh, I thought, maybe I am just a cosmic accident, you know, that now has found its way uh, on the earth. Um, and by the way, that picture is largely what's taught in public education since the 1960s. Uh, and uh, in my opinion, it's a tragedy. Only in 1999, when the Kansas School Board decided that in the state of California, uh, Kansas, no longer could they teach macroevolution, uh, what you saw, that picture there. They banned it from public education. Uh, it's pretty bold, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and uh, thank God that they did. Why did they ban it? Because macroevolution is not science at all. Mm. It's faith. Mm. It's religion. Um, I love the new meme that came across my uh, uh, Instagram page. Take a look at this. Uh, it says this. It's the same picture, but look at the guy at the end. He says, stop following me. We're not related. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> so let's talk about what the Bible says. First about creation. You'll recognize these Bible passages. The very first sentence of the Bible says this. In the beginning, God. Who? God. God created the heavens and the earth. In that very same chapter, it goes on to say this, then God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures after their kind. Note that word for a moment. It's going to be very important tonight. Let the earth bring forth living creatures after their kind. As an example, cattle and creeping things and beasts of the earth after their kind. And then uh, the beasts of the earth after their kind. And it was so, Genesis 1, 24 to 25. And then the height of God's creation, mankind. And uh, it's written this way, that God uh, made man in his own image. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he made them, male and female, he created them. You and I as people, we're at the height of God's creation. We're special. We're made in the image of God, and only we are. We're more than the animals. We're not just animals. Um, and deep down, basically every one of us know it's true. This resonates with our God-given conscience. Think about this. It's only people that compose beautiful sonatas. It's only people uh, that uh, teach in universities. It's only people that have ever sent somebody to the moon and back. It's only people that design microprocessors. You know what? We go to uh, the zoo to watch apes scratch themselves. We are made in the image of God, and we're right. different. Good, man. Amen. And the Bible goes on to reveal more about who and how of creation, too. Hebrews 11.3 says this, It's by faith we understand that the universe uh, was formed at God's command. How did he do it? By his own command. So that what is seen today was made from what was never visible Ex nihilo is the Latin phrase. God made everything out of nothing. I'll tell you what I believe. I'll summarize my belief in this. I believe by faith what Moses believed, and Moses had a personal conversation with God. I believe by faith what Jesus affirmed, and Jesus is God. That's right. That's right. And that's that God made everything from nothing. He created it all, and me included. Uh, and by the way, it's by faith that evolutionists believe what they believe, uh, too. It's not by science. Science is the practice of um, observable and testable phenomena. Um, you cannot test the creation of the world because it was a one-time event. I confess I was not there, but there was no scientist there either. It's not testable by the scientific method. Um, and uh, if you want to uh, challenge a scientist, just ask them to prove what they're trying to prove by the scientific method. Uh, sometimes I'll do this, and I'll, I'll just say this as a summary. I'm going to say it at the end of our time. There are smart people that believe in macroevolution, changing of kinds. There are smart people, just like you and I, most of us, we believe in creation. Um, and there are a few smart people that actually believe in a blend, and I'll deal with that later. Um, but sometimes I ask people when I'm having this discussion, listen, do you really consider yourself to be more wise than even Jesus? Mm -hmm. 
And, and I just watch them because they should uh, contemplate that. Are they really wiser than the living son uh, of God who walked on this earth? Because Jesus affirmed creation according to the Bible account. It, it was Oppenheimer who was involved in the uh, creation of the atomic bomb that said it so well. Uh, when that was finished, he said, oh my goodness, we become mental giants. And then he confessed, we remain moral infants. That's an insight into this That's discussion. Fair. You might wonder, why does it even matter? Why would we take the time when we're talking about the Bible to introduce the idea of creation and evolution? And I'll tell you, it matters greatly. There's nothing that more profoundly affects your life and the society we live in. If you haven't noticed and you haven't looked around, our society is crumbling before our eyes. Since the 1960s forward, it began. Um, we now live in a era that I would call demoralized. Morality has been completely removed from our lives. Um, evolution is the ultimate campus curse, and it's been dominating public education since the 1960s. Uh, I'm going to show you a video. It's evangelist Ray Comfort, and he's having a discussion with science department professors, and he's going to reveal and allow them to just confess that evolution is amoral. It's cruel, but wait for it. Following that, he's going to pose some questions to some young people. Let's take a look at this video. No, there's much more to evolution than just this kind of crude kill and be killed model that you have in your head. But I have seen a, a quote from Richard Dawkins saying, evolution in its rawest is incredibly cruel. It is. Yes. That was Hitler putting evolution into practice. Uh, that does not mean it was moral. Nobody it was immoral. Uh, nobody's claiming that evolution is a moral process. Evolution is a very harsh and cruel process. Do you believe in evolution? Yes, I do. You have a dog? Yes. Love your dog? I do love my dog. Yes, I do. I love animals. Okay. Well, your pet dog and your rotten neighbor are drowning. You'd only save one of them. Who would you save? Hmm. That is a tough one. You'd only save one? Mm -hmm. Why are you hesitating? I think I would save my dog. I don't, I don't know why I'm really hesitating. Because I don't know, I feel like I feel like people would see me as a bad person if I said the dog. Mm, I'll save my dog. So, is your neighbor not worth saving? Well, he's not worth saving more than my dog is. I'd go with the dog. Yeah. I mean, you, you would want to save the animal, so I would want to, I would want to save my dog. If well, we're animals, I believe we're all equal. I don't think humans have like a higher like place so you think uh, dogs are more valuable than human beings? Do you believe in evolution? Yes, I do. I so do. it's just a matter of survival of the fittest. Your neighbor's a, a primate, and you've got a canine, and you like the canine more than you like the primate. Would that be right? Pretty much, yeah. I mean, survival of the fittest. I mean, um, survival of the fittest? Yeah, pretty much. You said you believe in evolution. Mm -hmm. So it's just a matter of survival of the fittest. Yeah. If he drowns, he drowns. Big yeah. deal. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that is true. <laughs> are you an atheist? Uh, yeah. Hey, two thoughts. First of all, that should horrify you, doesn't it? Yep. Second of all, I hope that's not my neighbor. Because <laughs> if I'm ever in trouble, they're not coming to my rescue. <laughs> hey, this is just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, there are profound effects of uh, believing in evolution. Uh, I heard about a story of um, uh, a rabbi who was on a plane flight. And uh, an observer was watching as the students of the rabbi, which were noticeable, kept coming up to the rabbi. And uh, one would say, Rabbi, are you comfortable? Could I lift your feet? A uh, 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 couple minutes pass, another comes and says, Rabbi, let me get you a pillow for your head uh, and carry him for Rabbi, do you have enough water? And an observer looked at that and said to um, someone part of the group, said, why are they doting over the rabbi like that? And the answer came instantaneously, because they don't believe in evolution. Uh, that says a lot. Our entire criminal justice system is predicated on the idea that we are made in the image of God. We expect people to act a certain way, in a godly way, and when they don't, we punish them. Why would we punish people if they're just animals? Uh, why would we have any expectation of rehabilitation? Uh, think about the family. Uh, our family and the ideals of it come from the Bible and an idea that we're made in the image of God. I'm going to shock some of you. I hate this. I'm going to break your heart. Uh, I'm not trying to be mean, but I'm going to break your heart. Um, dolphins eat their own children and offspring. I'm sorry, little flipper, you know, flipper. They eat their own children and so do many other animals. I know that's sad. Uh, it's cruel. Um, and you should groan over that. But since 1960 in the United States, We've aborted 
to 20 million babies. You don't think evolution has an impact on the world that we live in? It does. Um, How do you define morality apart from the idea that we're made in the image of God? Evolution has no morality at all. How do you find meaning and purpose in life if you follow an evolutionary train of thought? You don't. It's a world without God. Now, I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to shock some people. The Bible says twice there is no God. That's kind of wild, isn't it? Uh, In two different Psalms, the Bible says there is no God. Right after it says, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. See, people don't say there is no God based on their head or their mind. They say it based on their heart. They're not ready to give their heart to God. And so uh, I want to just tell you what part of evolutionary theory is actually true that you can believe in as a Christian. What can we confirm? First is speciation. Now, speciation is why we see the broad variety of dogs. You see a little chihuahua. That's a chihuahua. Yeah, or a a Great Dane, right? And uh, there's a great variety. Why does that happen? Well, some through selective uh, breeding, but through microevolution, small little changes based on environment. Take a look at this chart of uh, the dogs. I mean, there's a wide variety. Lift your hand if you've got a doggy. You ought to love your doggy. They're kind of, as C.S. Lewis said, soulish creatures. Uh, I pray that there are dogs in heaven. I hope uh, they are ours because they're wonderful. They minister to us, but they are different than being made in the image of God like we are. Um, Second thing, speciation. Yeah, you want to clap on that. Um, Adaptation. Um, You probably saw in a textbook at some point a picture of a bunch of birds with different kind of beaks. Um, And the development of the beaks of the finches and the Galapagos Islands was cited by Darwin as evidence of macroevolution, but it really is just microevolution. It's adaptation. In response to necessity or environment, certain animals change certain small features. But by the way, just like those dogs, there's never been a chihuahua who's become a cat, right? And finch beaks change, but they stay Finches, uh, uh, listen closely to what a professor is about to say on this video. Um, Darwinian evolution is macroevolution. It's the change from one kind to another kind. We accept as Christians adaptation and speciation, but we cannot accept from the Bible a change of kind. And by the way, there's no evidence for it in the world. Mm-hmm. And so listen closely when this professor says, yes, they're still birds. Let's roll that video. Can you think of any observable evidence where there was a change of kinds? Fish. Human beings are still fish. Human beings are fish? Why, yes, of course they are. How long did that take? A couple of billions of years, millions. A couple of millions? How is that observable? It's not. We came out of the ground as a mammal, and one mammal created... Come out of the ground? Didn't we come out of the sea? Huh? Well, initially in the beginning, we came out of the ground and the sea after the great destruction of the... the... So do we have lungs or gills when we came out of the sea? You want to know something? Those that were in the sea, I guess, had gills, and those that were on land had lungs. But if we came out of the sea, we had you, gills in the sea. You want to know something? Who knows that we came out of the sea or we came out, we evolved from mammals? So you don't know? Huh? Of course I don't know. I'm accepting that they did their science correctly. Do you give me an example of Darwinian evolution, not adaptation or speciation, but a change of kinds? <laughs> These are changes of kinds. They're still fish. They are distinctly different fish. We have thousands of examples. Can you, can you give me one? I can give you, I can give you thousands, just one. one. For instance, I would say, uh, look at Lenski's experiments with bacteria then. So what do the bacteria become? Uh, the bacteria are still bacteria, of course. So that's not Darwinian evolution. That's not a change of kinds, is it? It, it is a change, it is a change in the genetic makeup of the bacteria, which but is still bacteria. So what do the bacteria become? Uh, a new kind of bacteria. It's still bacteria. There's no change of kinds. To summarize, the observable evidence that you give me for Darwinian evolution is bacteria becoming bacteria. No, it is bacteria acquiring new metabolic capabilities. You said before that there there is lots of evidence for evolution. I just want one observable evidence for Darwinian evolution, yeah, no, just one. But I gave you some, you don't want... Not some, I want one. Wait, you don't want that. That's I want one. Said, that's yes, I do, I'm pleading no, with you people. Said, you asked me to tell you, you asked me to tell you when I've watched one species evolve into another, isn't that right? No, one kind into another. There's 14, is it 14 different definitions of species? So I want a change of kind. When you're talking about kinds or change in families, you're, you're actually talking about, about macroevolution. You're talking about um, uh, changes on the level of, that separate, say, cats from dogs. 
So could you give me any examples of Darwinian evolution? Well, uh, in, when you say examples of that, then you have to sort of look at over a longer time frame. It has nothing to do with faith. Faith is something that I have to, unseen, I have to believe in. That's it, unseen. Look, right. do you believe evolution? Of course I do. Are you a believer in evolution? Yes, I am. When did you start to believe evolution? I started to believe evolution when I started to think out for myself. Is evolution a belief? Evolu ev well, you know something, evolution is a, is a thought process, is, is coming to terms and, and, and checking out all the, altern all the alternatives, like uh, taking a look at the, the religion, man-made religions. Let me ask you again, is evolution a belief? No, evolution is, well, yeah, in a, in a word, yeah, I could say it, it could be a belief. When you say change of kinds, you mean the evolution of one species from another or to another. Yes, we have that in action, actually, in the Galapagos. Could you give me one instance? Yes, we have an example from a group of birds called Darwin's finches. And you take a look at the difference between the finches on the islands that all started out. I mean, that's very, very observed. But that's not Darwinian evolution. There's been no change of kinds. What did the finches become? They become genetically new and anatomically new, recognizably different species. Are there still finches? Well, of course, they're still finches. Yeah, there's not a change. Of, there's no change of kind. Little birds that he uh, that he had observed. That oh, what did they become? Um, their beaks, their beak shapes. They're their still colors. birds. Yes, three finches that turn into different types of birds. Based they're on still the finches. Well, for example, Darwin and and his study on evolution of uh, the birds on the island that he went on to there. Their beaks changed. Their beaks. Uh, but they're still birds. There's no change of kinds. That's within the kind. It's evolution on the beaks. That's so that's called adaptation. It's not Darwinian evolution. There's no change of kinds. There's no different animal involved. And there you have it. Uh, uh, these professors are no smarter than you are. They really aren't. Uh, do you remember in uh, Karate Kid what Miyagi has to say to daniel son? daniel son, no bad students, only bad teachers. <laughs> and that's what you've just seen. So Darwin supposed 150 years ago that eventually the fossil record would support his hypothesis, that we would find lots of fossils of transitional kinds. And in the last 150 years, we simply have not. Instead, what we find is in the same strata, um, virtually all of the fossils. Um, think about this. This is called Darwin's dilemma. It refers to Darwin's uh, bafflement that the fossil record contradicted his theory. And uh, this is what uh, he said. It's indisputable that before the lowest Cambrian stratum was deposited, the world must have swarmed with living creatures. And yet he admits that the fossil record below the Cambrian strata seemed to be bereft or absent of such creatures. Instead, this is what we see and still see today. Species belonging to several of the main divisions of the animal kingdom suddenly appear in the lowest fossil rocks without any evidence of prior ancestral forms. Mm. And so Darwin frankly acknowledged <laughs> that this lack of ancestral forms was a valid argument against his theory. And so 150 years later, what scientists have done is they've come up with a new term to try to baffle us, and, and it's called punctuated equilibrium. You know what that means? Everything uh, showed up at the same instant. The wow. Bible record is the record uh, supported by the fossil record. Uh, it brings up one little uh, area I want to talk about for a moment. It's called the area of intelligent design. You know, ask an evolution someday uh, to explain the evolution of the human eye. Uh, they'll invariably start this way. Well, 50 million years ago, and then stop them, and you go, were you there? then this isn't science, is it? This is not observable, right? Uh, and they'll have to confess that. And uh, they cannot explain the evolution of the human eye in an adequate, logical way because the apparatuses in the eye all have to be present for it to work. They had to instantaneously be there together. Otherwise, there's no pattern to evolve into the eye. We call this an irreducibly complex machine. And there's several instances of it. Um, think about this. Uh, the evolution of the eye, the story they tell you, will be in direct contradiction to the second law of thermo thermodynamics, which says that the world is in entropy. Things break down. They go from ordered, complex, to disordered and simple. Um, beyond that, catch this phrase. Uh, rewind this a couple times to write it down. What nature randomly creates, it must by the same force in the next moment disintegrate. Now, that's brilliant. You don't know how brilliant that is. It took me a long time to write it. 
<laughs> but it's true. I'll explain it. Uh, in the idea of evolution, um, we don't just keep having mutation, 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 beneficial mutation that stays and sticks for a million years until the second beneficial mutation comes. Now I'm going to say it again, what I said. What nature, in quotes, randomly creates, it must by the same force in the next moment disintegrate. So you could have all the time in the world and you'll never get the results that they say we have. Uh, Darwin confessed this, in quotes, uh, about the evolution of the eye. It was absurd in the highest possible degree. Uh, in his book, Darwin's Black Box, uh, biochemist uh, Michael Behe, uh, a leading scientist and a spokesperson for creation and intelligent design, offered three examples of irreducibly complex uh, um, designs or systems. Uh, and I, I'm going to show you a picture of one. And this proves that uh, these, these um, animals, these existence, these features um, could not have evolved. The first one is the bacterium uh, flagellum. Now, a flagellum is the motorized device that propels uh, a bacteria. Uh, it's a chemically induced um, motor mechanism. When you look at this picture, every bit of this, the hook, the motor, the rod, uh, the, pep, uh, the peptide layer, all of this had to be in place all at once. There's no way these could have adapted individually and been beneficial. It's irreducibly complex, just like the human eye. Uh, equally complex is this. You'll know this one. The cascade of molecular reactions that occur in blood clotting. Think about this. You cut your arm. Instantaneously, your blood is exposed to oxygen, starts a chain reaction uh, that begins to thicken and clot, and yet it never thickens and clots inside the vein. Uh, it's unexplainable to scientists today. Use those ones uh, when you're uh, debating an evolutionist. The third one I won't go into, but the entire human immune system is irreducibly complex. My friend Frank Ayers graduated from UCR with a microbiology degree. Uh, the UC system is the highest level of, uh, of uh, school in, in California. And uh, I remember asking Frank, I said, hey, with the advancement in um, electron microscopes, you're seeing inside what we used to call the simple cell like we never had before. And he goes, oh, it's not simple at all. It is so wildly complex. And so I said, Frank, do your teachers still teach evolution, macroevolution? And he goes, well, yes, they do. He goes, mostly their undergrads teach it for them, but they do. And then I said this, do they believe it? And he goes, not one of them. Yeah. Not Sorry. one of them. This is the state of science today. Um, and, and I, and I want to tell you, there's reasons they don't teach it. Um, I mean, why they teach it, but they'll never publicly deny it. Um, they can't. They can't. And, and, and the reason is this. It was brought out in a great little uh, uh, documentary by economist Ben Stein, a movie called Expelled, No Intelligence Allowed. In that uh, movie, um, he shows why university professors cannot express their doubt on macroevolution and their support for creationism. Number one, they'll be denied tenure, and they are. Number two, they'll lose their job. Number three, they'll be refused publication. They won't be allowed to publish. The same is true as it always has been. In university research, it's publish or perish. And if they can't publish, they won't long remain in that job. Uh, and, and so what is it uh, that's preventing them from telling the truth? Political influence and financial influence. And so I'll just say this to you. Do not be afraid of scientists and so-called evolutionists. Instead, put them on the defensive. Now, they could trip you up, and I'm going to give you a little ammunition. Uh, you remember that picture starting with the chimpanzee and evolving through, you know, all of these, you know, Cro-Magnon man and, you know, all, Piltdown man and all of these. By the way, those are mostly hoaxes. You want to have some fun? Google evolutionary hoaxes, and you're going to see 50 years of hoaxes. Uh, the Piltdown man, I think, is the one. They constructed this entire skull from a mere tooth. And then 10 years later, found out it was a tooth of a pig. Wow. That's what we're dealing with. That's the state of science, right? But they will say this. Well, isn't it true that chimpanzees and humans share 98.8% the same DNA? And it's kind of true. But it's not true. That 98.8% 
each one of those markers could be in an on state or an off state. It could be on in a primate, and it could be off in a human. It doesn't make us uh, share a common ancestry. It only shows we have common design and a common designer. Doesn't that make sense? I mean, that's a profound truth, right? God has a vast, wide variety of designing things, and he's used some of the design in differing uh, animals. Uh, And uh, some of the design he used in people are also found in animals. By the way, let's talk about the 1.2% that's different between a chimpanzee and a human. Um, Did you know that that represents 35 million different variations? We're different than chimpanzees in 35 million ways at least. Uh, (laughs) Some may ask this final question, I'm gonna wrap up with it. Can I believe both in macro evolution, the change from kind to kind to kind and the Bible at the same time? Um, I acknowledge that smart people, a few of them do, but I would say not really. If you're going to be true to the biblical account, you can't hold to that. Um, uh, It's called theistic evolution. I'll show you a picture of it. What they uh, propose is that God started the whole world and created everything, but then used evolution as the process for which to bring man into the world. But that's contrary uh, to the word of God. Um, And again, I'll just remind you what the psalmist said. The fool is said in his heart, not his head that there is no God. It's a heart issue. I want to tell you about the evolution I believe in, and I've seen it at work. I believe in the changing of a heart, the renewing of a mind. And for 2,000 years, we've seen it since Jesus Christ came into the world. I'll clap for that. Um, And it's true. You know, 2,000 years ago, God sent his own son in the world so that we could know him. I've never seen God with these eyes. I believe by faith that he exists. But there were people that saw the son of God. They saw him do miracles, walk in a holy manner, teach the things of God on this earth. And then uh, public tide turned against him. He was betrayed and he was crucified. But he said this, he wasn't crucified on the cross for anything he had done wrong, but rather to pay the penalty of all of our sins, the sins of mankind. And anybody who would put their faith and trust in him and say what Jesus did on the cross matters to me would never have to pay the penalty for their own sins. It's an exchange rightness, righteousness. Those that do that, we call them Christians, followers of Jesus Christ, will stand before God as righteous as his own dear son. How about you? Have you made that decision by faith? Have you put your faith in the son of God? Any one of us can do it. Tonight you could do that. And I'm going to share with you how to do that. You open up your heart to him, and we're going to do it in prayer in just a moment. You invite him to come in, to become the Lord, which means the maximum authority in your life, to be your Savior, the one that paid the penalty for your sin. And you make a commitment that now you'll live the rest of your days according to his will and his way. And I'll tell you what, if you'll do that, he'll become as real as anybody you know in this world and he'll reserve the next world for you. You'll have the very hope of heaven and eternity with other believers in God himself. Well, as I get ready to lead that prayer, following that prayer, you're gonna have the opportunity to let us know that that happened. There'll be some instructions on your screen. There'll be an opportunity to text, but anybody could go to crossroadschurch.family and click on next steps. But I wanna lead you in that prayer now. Would you bow with me? And heavenly father, we do bow before you. We thank you for the truth of your word that we're made in your image. We're special and we sense it and we know it. And may we never abuse that privilege. God, thank you that Jesus made real life possible. And so we pause to pray for Annie who's hearing this message. Maybe a friend shared it with them. They just wanted them to know the truth and rescue them from the idea of evolution and the idea that we're just mere animals. And for that person, we pray now, God, would you touch their heart? Would you convince them that Jesus is the only way forward? Would you convict them of their need for a savior, convict them of their sin? And so God, as you move upon people in their hearts and we continue to pray, I wanna ask anybody, maybe it's you. Maybe this message has touched your heart and you wanna give your heart to Christ and you wanna come to know him in a personal way. I'm about to lead a prayer. And if you would pray it right now where you're at, you could pray it out loud but you could even whisper it. God knows your very thoughts. If you'll pray it in sincerity, he will become real to you. He'll come and take up residence in your heart. And so would you pray something like this? Would you say, Lord Jesus, I know you love me and God does love you. Oh, he loves you. Lord Jesus, I know you love me. And I realize you died on the cross to forgive me of my sins, even to heal me of my hurts, even to free me of my fears that I have in this life. You died to make me alive, to make me brand new. 
So I say, yes. Yes, I want you. I want the life that you have for me to live. And so I'm opening up my heart to you. Would you fill me with your love? Fill me with your spirit and help me become the person you always wanted me to be. For this I pray in your holy name, amen. And I just want to congratulate you if you prayed that prayer. The Bible says angels in heaven rejoice whenever one does, and we do as well. And so would you do this? Would you type um, uh, the word amen using your cell phone? Would you text that to that number that we gave you earlier? 77247, God, God all the time. And we're gonna respond to you and help you grow in your faith. I wanna thank you for being part of this, uh, this uh, uh, time together, but we're gonna continue now in worship. Let's lift our hearts to the Lord. And for some of you, now you're a child of God. You're lifting up your heart to him as a son or daughter of God. Let's sing together.
Before I spoke a word, you were singing over me. You have been so, so good to me. Yes. Before I took a breath, you breathed your life in me. You have been so, so kind to me. All the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the nine to nine. I couldn't turn it, and I don't deserve it. Still, you give yourself away. Oh.
good to be with everybody tonight. Wise King Solomon said this, it's the glory of God to conceal a matter. It's the glory of man to seek it out. You never have to be afraid of what science will discover in our world because all truth belongs to God. That's right. And he is the God of all truth. I want to say God bless each of you as you go your way this week. Be sure to share this message with somebody who needs it, but may you walk in the confidence knowing you've been made in the image of God. God bless you. Thanks again for joining us. Here at Crossroads, we're all about helping people take their next step. So, what's your next step? Whether you've made a decision to follow Jesus, want to be baptized, or you're interested in knowing more about God and the Bible through our Alpha class, we can help you take your next step at crossroadschurch.family. We also want to invite you to gather your family and friends to join us right here online again next week. We're live Wednesdays at 7 p.m. or Sundays at 9 a.m. So if you're watching on YouTube, hit that subscribe button and you'll never miss out on any new messages. If you found this message encouraging, click the like button and let us know how we can pray for you this week in the comments. Finally, if your life is being impacted by Crossroads and if you wanna be part of making an impact all over the world, you can head to crossroadschurch.family to do that now. Thanks again for watching and we'll see you next time.